Did you ever walk into a movie, say 15, 20 minutes late, and you find a seat and you look up at the screen and you see what's going on up there, but you have no idea what's going on. You don't know who the actors are. You don't know what characters they're playing or why. You don't know the plot. Maybe you're sitting next to a friend. And so you turn to your friend and you say, what's going on? And your friend gives you a real short introduction to what's going on. Um, Maybe from time to time you say, who's that? And they tell you who that character is and what's happening. And uh, you begin to figure out what's going on in the screen and figure out what all the pieces are, what all the characters are, where the plot is, where they are in the plot. And um, then you begin to enjoy the movie. Well, I think most people are like that about life. They know that they are in the story, but they're not sure just where they are in the story or how they got there or how the story ends or where the whole thing is going or who the main character are are, or what the plot is or, or just where they fit. And it's as though they know that life is going on, but they're not entirely sure what it's all about. Um, They know what other people say it ought to be about, you know, you make money and 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 you get married and you have kids and then you retire and you know They know that part of it, but it doesn't really make sense to them and Not only that, but they don't see the bigger picture They don't see what came before their part in the story and they don't know what comes after They don't know really what life was like before they were born. They don't really know what it's going to be like after they die. In fact, they have a hard time conceiving of any life at all without them here being a part of it. Different religions give different answers to these questions. Buddhism, for example, says that life is cyclical, that you are born and you live your life and then you die and then you get reborn and you live another life and you die and you get reborn and you live another life and and the quality of life that you live depends on how you live the previous life so if for example you lived a very good life then you could be born to a higher realm and have a better life the next time around. You might be richer. You might have a more comfortable life. You might be born into a higher position in society. If, on the other hand, you don't live a very good life, then your next life could be far worse and spiraling downward. So the idea is that you kind of you always get what you deserve. If you don't live a very good life, then you don't get a very good next life. This idea, the idea of karma, is that you always get what you deserve. You can never escape it. And since it is obvious that there are many stinkers in this world who are living pretty nice lives, it must be that they are going to live a worse life in the future. And since there are many really good people who are living pretty stinky lives, it must be because of something that they did in the past. So um, the idea of the cyclical nature of life um, is, um, is inherent in the concept that you always get what you deserve either in this life or the next, and that the best you can hope for is to live higher and higher and higher and better and better qualities of life until eventually you are able to escape this endless cyclical cycle of birth and rebirth, of reincarnation. And finally you are set free from life in this world to be absorbed into the great cosmic nothingness that is pure delight. 
Secularism, on the other hand, says uh, the world is a closed sack. In fact, that's what the word secularism comes from, the Latin seculum or sack. And in this sack, you have only what you have. You have natural stuff. And there is nothing outside, and so nothing can come into the sack from the outside. There is no God to intrude. There are no miracles. Everything is natural, and everything is inside the sack. So that's uh, kind of ruled by natural processes, and as a matter of a priori, uh, anything miraculous or supernatural is ruled out. So God cannot exist. Miracles cannot exist. Cause and effect, natural process, natural law is all there is. Secularism, of course, doesn't even attempt to answer the question of how all this stuff came to be apart from any natural process. Um, if you rule God out right from the beginning, then you have to find natural causes for how everything came to exist. Hence, evolutionism, Darwinism, naturalism, secularism are a religion of their own, but an anti-supernatural kind of religion. Christianity, on the other hand, has a very different way of answering these questions. And as you might expect, since it's called Christianity, the answer is all wrapped up in Jesus Christ, who he is and what he said and what he did. Mm, let me see if I can illustrate it like this. This is my life, or your life, doesn't really matter. It has a beginning, we call it birth, and it will have an end, it hasn't yet. We call that death. Now we know that there was a lot of history before we were born, and so we'll illustrate that back there. And we know that probably after we die, life is going to go on, and there's going to be some more history coming after with generations still to be born. Now. Most of us have got that down pretty well, but this is what the Bible adds to the story that I think is really, really important. Not only does it tell us about you know human history back thousands of years, but it also tells us that once upon a time, human history was quite different. That in fact, human history was kind of like this up here, and that it was what God had created in the beginning. Genesis tells the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God created everything, and then after he created, he looked at it and he said, it's good, this is really good. And when he was finished, towards the end of creation week, finished with creating the earth and everything in it, uh, as his crowning act of creation, he created human beings. And he said, yeah, this is really good, I like this. Male and female, he created them. Now, we don't know how long things went along like that, but we do know, according to the Bible, tells the story in Genesis chapter 4, that there came a moment in which human beings decided, for reasons that we can't really fathom, to use their God-given gifts of freedom, liberty, freedom of choice, to exercise that freedom of choice in a very bad way, a way that turned away from God and essentially said to God, we don't need you, we don't want you, we can make our own way in the world, and we're going to do our own thing, so butt out. And that moment, which is described in Genesis chapter 4, which theologians refer to as the fall, changed everything. And the world that was ceased and a new kind of world came into existence. We call it the world, meaning the world that we know, the world that we live in and always have lived in, that all human beings have lived in. And, and we could distinguish it from what we might label as the kingdom of God being the way things were supposed to be, the way God made them, the way God wanted them to be. But here we are, down here in the world, and it is in this world that you and I were born, and it is in this world that we live our lives, and it is in this world that we will die, 
And all around us are all these other human beings that are in a similar situation in this world. And in this world there are wars, and in this world there are terrible things like crime and poverty and murder and innocent babies dying and children being abused and all kinds of terrible things. But there are also some good things, you know, there's there's roses on the thorns and there's beautiful trees and, and there's babies being born and blue skies and sunshine and lots of good stuff too, but it all takes place in this world. All the living and dying, all the doing, uh, all the successes and failures, it all takes place in this world. And this is what we know. We don't know the kingdom that used to be. None of us have seen it. And we've only heard about it. But we do have this kind of intuitive sense that there must be something to it because we kind of instinctively know that life shouldn't be the way it is, that there's something wrong with it. That in fact every religion says, yeah, this world is unsatisfactory, this life is unsatisfactory, it's not supposed to be this way. We must have been made for something better than this because, by golly, we're, we're just not, not satisfied with the way things are. And, and so we have this kind of primordial, vestigial sense that there was something bigger and better for which we were made. And there's something wrong with the world in which we live. Well, the Bible affirms that, and it says, yes, there is something wrong with this world in which we live, and one of these days, God's going to fix it. He's going to put it back together again. He's going to make it right. And the kingdom that was over here is going to be reestablished as God's kingdom over here. And, in fact, this is the kingdom that will come. And the Bible says this is what God is going to do someday. He's going to make the earth new. He's going to recreate all things. And it's going to be the way it was. And God is going to put things back the way he wanted them originally before they were interrupted by sin. And he's going to have his universe the way he intended it to be. And all of this, this whole world thing down here, you know, this, this whole thing that you and I refer to as the world in which we do all of our living and dying, all of human history is going to be no more. It's going to be in the past. And not only that, but it's going to be kind of like a, a parenthesis in the whole scheme of eternity. And the way things used to be and the way things are going to be again will sort of be reestablished. And it'll be as though this whole parenthesis thing, you know, is gone. Like it never really took place. And interestingly enough, in the scheme of things, when you think about it, if you were to draw this to scale, this part over here is so long and goes back into eternity. And this part here is so long and goes forward into eternity that this piece in the middle is really, 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 really tiny. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like a crack in a superhighway that goes from the East Coast of the United States to the West Coast. It's, it's a crack in the pavement. It's a momentary lapse in the way things are supposed to be and the way things will be again. Now, the biblical story says that God is going to do this, that this is tied to what we call the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming, well, that implies that there was a first coming. And of course, we know that there was. There was a time when God, in the form of Jesus, came down into this world and became a human being. We celebrate that every Christmas. And then, a few years later, this Jesus was rejected and executed under the Roman governor Pontius Pilate on a cross and put to death. And his death on that cross became a significant act necessary for the reestablishment of the kingdom of God. That in fact what happened was that the cross here became the necessary event that was able to wipe out all the mess of this world and to reestablish 
the kingdom of God. In other words, it made it possible for God to do what he said he would do. And, in fact, uh, guaranteed that he would do it. So this event, uh, wrapped up in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, becomes the guarantee that God is going to put things back together the way they were, the way he wants them to be. And this becomes then the guarantee, the assurance, that our lives down here in this world, even though they might be kind of nasty and bad and ugly, even though we might suffer and die, even though terrible things happen down here in this world, that the reality is that this world is only temporary, that in fact it is passing away, and that before terribly long, it will exist no more, the parenthesis will close, and the kingdom of God will be reestablished, and you and I, because of what Jesus did, will have the privilege of living in that kingdom forever and ever and ever. And when we look back on this whole thing called this world, we'll have a hard time even remembering it, because it was so long ago, and it was such a short, brief, little, insignificant episode in the history of eternity. And that's the way Christianity explains all of this. Different than Buddhism, different than secularism, different than every other religion. It explains it uniquely as an item of good news that has been accomplished by God through the doing and dying of Jesus and that enables us to enter into the life of God, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Jesus has done for us, that he offers us as a gift, a free gift, an amazing gift. Let me see if I can wrap this up and close the circle. We've been talking about in the beginning, and what we meant by that was not the beginning of my life or your life or even the beginning of human existence, but really the beginning of God's plan for humanity. And um, what we need in order to figure that out is some kind of authoritative statement, not just one that comes out of our own heads or out of some fairy tale someplace. Um, when we look at the Bible, what we see is a consistent story that says this is how it all began and this is what it's all about. And then we see the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus as being the substantiation of that story. So if in fact Jesus did live and die and was resurrected, then the story is true as it's told and we can trust it. And what this gives us essentially is called a biblical worldview. And I mean by that that we get a worldview, a way of understanding the world and our place in it, how we got here, what our job is, where we're going, a way of understanding all that that comes from the Bible. Now, there are lots of reasons why we believe that the biblical worldview is an authoritative and accurate worldview, and we'll go into that in future podcasts. But for right now, we're simply saying this biblical worldview gives us a beginning, it gives us a middle, and it gives us an end. And that beginning, middle, and end um, helps us to locate our place in the story and know who we are and what our lives are about, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. 